Good afternoon. Today I'm going to be interviewing a woman by the name of Crystal Garcia Riley. Crystal is the founder of In a Skirt podcast, in which they share inspiring stories of female runners from all around the world, all wearing skirts. Crystal herself comes from the Pentecostal sect of Christianity, and in this podcast, she's going to be sharing her own insights into modesty, as well as the ways in which modesty in Christianity and Judaism both line up. Enjoy. Hello. Hello, Crystal. Yes. Crystal, thank you so much for joining me today. And, yeah, I'm um, as you know, I have this brand of modest active wear. Yes. And look- I'm always searching to, you know, expand and kind of like do more things in in the realm of modesty and active. And so I came across your podcast and I found it so inspiring that there's actually a podcast in a, in a skirt podcast designed to kind of like hear stories of girls in in skirts and their story of how they own it. So um can you share with us, Crystal, how you got into this? Yeah. Um, so I've been wearing skirts pretty much my whole life. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things I'm used to wearing, used to wearing them. So I don't think about it a lot. But um, as I got older, I, um, you know, when I was younger, there weren't a lot of, there weren't any modest fitness companies. Um, and so we had to get really creative um, with what I wore when I was younger um, and tried to play sports but I wasn't very athletic. And when I got older and I started running, um, I didn't find any at first. I think I wore like swim skirts to run. And finally these modest fitness companies started popping up. And then the past couple of years I've started following modest athletes and just really been inspired by, by them, by the, I don't care if I have to wear something different. And if I don't look like the traditional athlete, I'm going to get out there and do it. And um, is it, is it BD? I think, you know, who I'm talking about the, the Israeli. Yeah. B-Deutsch. Yes. And so runner's world did, um, a story on her about winning, I guess the Tel Aviv marathon in a skirt. And I was reading that article and I thought, look at her in a skirt. And that phrase just kept sticking in my head in a skirt, in a skirt. And every time I saw a woman do something awesome in a skirt, I would think in my head, oh, look at her. She's doing it in a skirt. And I thought, I just need, I just need, I need to create something about what women are doing in a skirt. And if it's not really just women in a skirt, maybe it's just people who look different or felt different. And because of size or age or what they wore, they always felt like they couldn't do things. Um, and they're, they're coming out of the woodwork and saying, you know, regardless of what I wear, of how old I am, of what I weigh, I'm going to do these things. And so that's kind of just threw that around to my husband, that idea. And he said, well, let's do a podcast because he's really techie. He said, I'll Mm -hmm. help you with it. And so we decided to call it in a skirt and go from there. That's so cool. So first of all, I love your accent. Oh, I'm from (laughs) Texas. It's like a proper Southern accent. Yeah. (laughs) yeah it's like... texas sorry i'm from texas this oh so cool awesome um yeah my family used to live in texas before before we came to israel oh so... really where um houston okay yeah that's that's a couple hours from where i live that's so cool uh yeah but uh, the accident stick with us so <laughs> <laughs> but um okay cool so um what i want to say so Basically, you got the inspiration for the podcast from BD Deutsch? Yeah, I think the idea had been in my head. I had been following people doing things in a skirt. But then when Runner's World, you know, said, hey, look at what she's doing, this mother of five, and this is how she dresses. I actually shared that Runner's World article on my personal Facebook page and said, "Look look at what she's doing. And then I put the phrase in a skirt. And that's the first time you know, I put those words together Mm. and I just liked the way they sounded. And uh, so I started following her after, after that on Instagram. Um, and then just started looking for more people like BD doing these things in a skirt. But yeah, she was the first one who kind of cemented that idea in my head. Mm. That's really beautiful. And it's also really beautiful because it almost sounds like a metaphor because the second you were saying you know people doing stuff in a skirt it's not only in a skirt it's also the whole idea of looking different and feeling different and 
I think that so many of us from around the world, whether they come from Jewish backgrounds or Christian backgrounds, okay, they're wearing a skirt and like the second they're doing this together, they're kind of like coming coming to one, like they're becoming one in this new unity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's it's neat. I've been able to reach out to there's been several Jewish ladies I've, you know, started conversations with on Instagram. And I don't think I even realized um how much the cultures were similar in standards of dress. Um and I feel more unified like you said with them and with people who are who are doing these activities and being active in similar dress. That's amazing. So what kind of similarities do you see between our religions? Um, I think it's, they're very family oriented um, uh, and just the, they're all moms, <laughs> you know, multiple <laughs> children. So there's Beatty, she's got like, you know, five, I think. Um, there's um, another woman I started following on Instagram and she has several kids, but um, very, very family oriented, very um, centered around their children but then also trying to start this new movement of, yes, you're a mom. Yes, you have children, but take care of yourself too. You know, it's okay to be active. It's okay to be, um, to have self care, to take care of yourself and not just your children. Um, the family time is very important. Uh, they all do things with their children, trying to incorporate activities into their child rearing. Um, so that's similar. And just, you know, the separation of, of, um, of what women and men look like. That's huge, I think, in, in both of our cultures. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, as you know, I, I come from a Jewish Orthodox background. What's your background? I'm Pentecostal. Um, Pentecostal? Yes, I'm Pentecostal. And um, so we kind of have a lot of the same standards of of dress, you know, we, the women have longer hair, um, and we don't wear pants or shorts, the women. Um, so we wear skirts that tend to be knee length or longer, um, sleeves, um, at least short sleeves or longer. And so we just believe that, you know, men and women are different, you know, they're, they're both special (laughs) and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Um, but we believe in keeping the identity of, of male and female separate and that um, we have modest dress. Um, so that's kind of, I think, I think those are similar to what you all believe. Very interesting. I've never actually heard of the, of the um, term pin, Pentecostal. Is yes. that a Christian, a Christian sect? Yeah. Yeah. It's part of the Christian church. Um, so we're, we're a little bit different than a lot of, mainstream Christians probably because of our standards of dress um but yeah we're I mean we're we're regular Christians (laughs) you know we just uh we're called Pentecostal or apostolic um Uh. those two like we say we we follow the apostles doctrine um and but we have a lot of um we have a lot of beliefs in just the way you know people look and present themselves with modesty and in action and in dress and an attitude um beliefs like that and and when I was in law school there was um a large group of orthodox Jews who went to my law school and um I talked to them for a while because they all they all thought I was um Jewish so they were surprised (laughs) that's hilarious you're not because of the way you're dressing yes yes because of the way I dressed um Oh, yeah so, so that's so like cool. no and I thought you guys were Pentecostal so <laughs> that's really funny yeah. you know also in Jerusalem because you have so many different religions here very often I'll go to shul and I'll meet so many different types of um, religions that like you know Mormons and like people that come from like Amish communities that just they look like they're Jewish yes. they look totally you know and then you never know yes but uh, it's really funny that ties us together you know I actually heard of apostolic sportswear which apparently is also a modest brand of sportswear yes have you ever heard of them um I know is, is there a specific brand called 
I, I recall it actually being called apostolic sportswear okay. when I was doing like my research online. And, and it's funny that now, you know, you're saying it's the same thing as Pentecostal. Yeah. So yeah. basically what I understand is that in the Pentecostal religion, the whole source for modesty is really just to separate. Between yeah. It's that. And we, and, you know, we um, dress. believe, you know, God created separate sexes and we believe in, in modesty um, we also believe, you know, that we're supposed to be different, um, that we're supposed to, we're, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Um, you know, we're, we're all active contributors to our community, to our societies, but that doesn't mean that we take on all of the characteristics and attributes of, of um, the way the world's going. Um, so we're, we're peculiar, peculiar, we're different, we, we stand out, we should have some sort of sign that we're different than everybody else and, and be okay with that. You know, it's kind of like, um, a lot of times we call what we wear our standards and that, that word always means something to me because in the Bible, um, when we talk about when well, in the old Testament, um, the different tribes would carry a standard, which was a flag. It was a sign of who they were. And so to me, my clothes are a standard because they're a sign to the world. This is who I am. And this is what I believe. You know, I'm, 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 I'm different. And if you're looking for something different, mm-hmm. for something wholesome, for something pure, that's what, that's what I should be. And my clothes should reflect an inner heart. That's the same. So what kind of other modesty preferences do you have besides like people? Um, well, we don't, we don't cut our hair. Wearing um, the women don't cut our hair and we believe men should have short hair Mm. um to differentiate my husband doesn't wear shorts um he wears pants um like even if he runs or cycles you know he wears he wears pants or he wears like um long tights under them um to separate himself as well um I don't wear makeup um that's not everybody's choice but that's mine um and you know we also believe your speech should be modest the way you talk, um, you know, the words that you say, the language that you use, that should be something that you would, you would say in front of your children or in front of your pastor. You should keep it that way all the time. Um, just appropriate, mm-hmm. modest speech. Um, mm. So stuff like that. Wow. So, you know, it really does sound, um, Crystal, that, you know, Judaism and this um, Pentecostal like religion really do line up in that way of you know how modesty really isn't just a way of dressing it's also a way of behavior and separating between the sexes and kind of like you know uniting us and making us unique in our own special way that's really awesome uh, it does sound though like yes. the men are yes, going to start needing wears, modest activewear. Uh, and not as well. everybody <laughs> does that, but, but he does um, to to make himself different. You know, he believes he should have something too. Um, but yes, there's not a lot of um, lightweight pants out there. Yeah, totally. You know, also in Israel, we have lots of very religious people. They're called Haredim. And it's very interesting. Like, sometimes I'll see them running around in Gan Saker, which is like the central park of Jerusalem. And they're just running around in these black pants. Oh, and I just like, so I beautiful. suffer just looking at them doing it. But uh, I, I really think someone needs to just like come yeah, out and solve this All problem. All these women you know? came out and solved it for women. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. We need like one pro fashion entrepreneur Something to come out yeah. and start doing this. Like, you know, maybe who knows? It might be. even be that's a bigger funny. market than the women. You never know. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. So basically, okay, cool. So you notice that there's whole this whole community you got really inspired by Inniskirt. And now today, your podcast basically covers these unique stories of unconventional runners on a weekly basis yeah so that's what I'm doing it's fun Um, when I started off I was thinking oh am I gonna run out of stories you know I'm gonna run out of people where's it gonna go and I'm not um, I have a hard time um, just going up to someone and introducing myself you know have a have a hard time with that it always seems awkward to me but now that I have this podcast it's given me this this avenue um to approach people 
and to hear their stories. And I've, I'm realizing there's never going to be a lack of stories. Um, there are so many people out there who just seem like ordinary, regular people, but they're inspiring. Just your everyday person has an inspiring story. And I really feel like they're more inspiring sometimes than professionals because mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a lot, a lot of um, professional athletes, they're so above us, like in a whole other world when it comes to their skill set. that I love listening to interviews with them. And I love listening to what they're doing because it's awesome. Just hearing all of that, but I don't ever really feel um, totally inspired by, you know, someone who could win an Olympic gold medal, because that's, that's not, that's not me. That's on a whole other level, but it's these everyday people who we go to work with, or we go to church with that, that are doing things they thought they could never do that I find so awesome because they're telling everybody else in the world who thought I, I could never do this because I'm too overweight or I'm too old or I look too different. They're telling them, yeah, you can look, I did it. Um, you know, I have a, a friend at work who lost 115 pounds by just oh my changing God. her diet and getting out there and walking and then running. And she's inspiring because she's the person who said at one time I could never do those things. And then she did. And so just having this podcast is just giving me a way to go approach people, introduce myself and listen to their stories. I've, I met someone new yesterday on a bike ride and he told me his wonderful story. And I thought, well, I'm going to have to remember him and get him on the podcast. <laughs> That's great. You should carry your own business cards with you everywhere you go. I know. I know. You know? Um, well, actually, in one of my Hanabana skirts, we have zippers in the back so you can actually carry your cards with you. <laughs> that is That's a great idea. I'll have to get one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Um, that's so great. That's really awesome. You know, I guess really the inspiration isn't really just in the people that are up there. It's really finding inspiration every day, every type of people. Um, yeah. Is there, is there any one that specifically moved you from the people that you already interviewed? Yeah. So the one that I've gotten the most positive feedback on is um, a woman named Claudia Cook. And she's the one who works with me, who lost a lot of weight because she was in her forties. Um, she had, she had gotten, um, she gotten large, you know, she was, uh, overweight and had a very sedentary lifestyle. She had two kids. Um, she works very, very hard. And so she put all of her energy and all of her life into her job, into her children. And she had reached that point that I think so many women reach, you know, mid forties, have poured everything into a career and into children and you wake up one day and you realize that you've lost yourself um, and, and maybe you're not happy with who you are. And I think so many people just shut down at that point. You know, that's upsetting, that's depressing. And she just decided, this is not who I want to be. I want to be there for my children long-term. I want to like myself. I want to be happy. And just that day made the decision to live differently. And she didn't have weight loss surgeries. She just started watching what she ate and no particular diet. You know, there was no, let me go on this diet, that diet. It was just, let me be smarter about what I eat. She lost about 40 pounds doing that. Then she started going outside and walking that led to running. Um, she joined a fitness group that she liked, that she felt comfortable, that she felt accepted with, mm -hmm. um, that didn't make her feel like she didn't belong and didn't make her feel awkward, um, joined that group. And 115 pounds later, she's doing 5Ks all the time. She's about to do her first Spartan race. And that was- What's a Spartan got... race? The Spartan race is the, um... oh, they may not be international, I guess. I don't know. I thought they were. They're, they're obstacle course races. And so like, um, it, like if you do a, a 5K, it may have 30 obstacles in it where you have to climb walls, do burpees, climb up ropes, lift a bucket of rocks, stuff mm -hmm. like that during the run. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extreme. You, yeah, you can't just run. You have to have some strength to, to you too. Mm -hmm. um, so she's doing one of those in June. And there she's gone from this quiet kind of let me hide myself person to 
feeling great, a lot of confidence. You can see it in the way she dresses, in the way she talks, um, in the way she's even more involved in the community now because she has this level of self-love that she didn't have before. Wow. People have just found her really inspiring because I think everybody identifies with her, you know, and is just inspired by her commitment and, and her her just saying one day, I just don't want to be like this. Like, I'm going to change. I can be who I want to be. And, and I can start right now. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Was there like one moment in her story? Obviously, I have to listen to this podcast. But was there one yeah. moment in the story that she, that was her like moment of realization that like she really wants to start this journey? Yeah, she said it was realizing she, um, it was something I hadn't heard before. She said the way you eat um, can be an addiction. And she feels like the way she was eating was an addiction. There was a food addiction there. And she said, it's like any other addiction or any other person who has something bad in their life that they need to change. No one can make you do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always trying to intervene and help people um, who have some sort of unhealthy facet to their life. And she said, it, it, it's being um, unhealthy is just like all of those. You can't ever make someone do it. It has to be that self-realization where you say, I'm done. I'm done with this lifestyle. I want to change for myself and not because anybody's telling me. And her kids were growing up and she realized that she may not be there for important parts of their life if she continued on an unhealthy journey. And so it was admitting that she had a problem with food and wanting to be there long term for her children. And I think she wanted her children to to have a positive, healthier life and to be able to see what their mom could do. Yeah, for sure. I kind of feel like in our religions, the whole idea of weight is kind of like... Um, it's weight and health and sports and everything. It's kind of balanced. Like also modesty, the whole concept of modesty, you know, you're supposed to dress well to cover up and have your inner beauty. And then also um, speak in a certain way and take care of yourself in a certain way and be healthy in a certain way. I feel like it's also like tied together, you know, also in Judaism, yeah. we have a whole concept of, um, it's a very good deed to always be happy so I think that the beauty of of you know belonging to these different religions is kind of like it's a package deal where you know you're not just doing something to just lose weight and you know look good you're losing weight to be a vessel for your god and you're losing weight to be healthy so you can fill your role in this girl in this world and I don't know if it's like very intertwined into part of the lifestyle yeah, and, and it, it should be if some people think that it is, and it definitely should be because the if, if you believe what we believe, you know, you and I, we were created in the image of God. You know, he created us. He gave us these bodies as a gift and as a temple. So just like you wouldn't misuse any other gift he gave you, why would you misuse or mistreat the most personal, precious gift he gave you, your own life? For sure. I think though it's a little bit of a struggle sometimes, like obviously not to wait until 40, but even in our day to day life, people in their 20s and their 30s, when is it the point that you look up and you say, hey, am I really doing my role in this world? Yeah. Like, how do I know I'm doing the ro- my role in this world? How do I how do I know? Well, yeah, because life is just busy. <laughs> and so, you know, I, exactly. I feel, I feel like all of my 20s, I didn't even have time to stop and think because you're just. You're you trying know. to get there, wherever there is. You know, you're just trying to get there in your life. Yeah, like, you know, what you're saying is obviously you have these women who are married with kids trying to balance it with having kids, but also women before they get married, you know, there's the whole pressure to get married to religions. And mm-hmm. and if you're not married by a certain age, people start looking at a certain way. And, and also then in your own private life, people in their 20s, late 20s want to want to feel like they're filling their role. And if it's not a role of obviously building families and Jewish or Christian or whatever community like you know we also have other roles in life besides just being moms and um and as as the time goes by more and more things get busier more and more so like I don't know when when do you take the step to yeah take a step back and 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 assess 
and that's been I'm I'm 36 and I feel like I'm just starting to think I I, I feel like the way it's and I don't know if it's the same up there, but the way it is here in America is you spend your whole twenties seeking a career. Um, you know, that's your, you're in school, you're in school, you're in school, you're trying to find what you're supposed to do and then build that up and work really hard. And my twenties were, it was going to college and then going to law school and having babies. And it was just this whirlwind. And then I get to mid thirties and my, you know, my kids are growing and I have this career and I'm like, wait a minute, wh- what am I doing? Like, I mm-hmm. love my job and I love my family, but surely I wasn't intended just to wake up every morning, go to that job and have no other effect on this world. Mm-hmm. Sure there was another purpose. So where do you find your purpose, Crystal? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I think I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> this is uh, a small wake up call. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no pressure at all. I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure that out. I've, I've got, I have a, I have a real passion for, um, for children. I, um, I'm a lawyer and a small part of my practice is representing children who are in child protective cases, um, who've been, you know, removed by the state because of abuse or neglect. Um, and so I have a small practice representing them, children in foster care. And I, I'm really trying to do something personally to get the word out um, about how we need more foster and adoptive parents in our state and in our country. We have too many children um, available for adoption or in foster families who just need help. They need, they need loving families. And I'm, I'm pro-life, but I believe pro-life is so much more than, you know, just saying, you know, you, you shouldn't have an abortion. I think it's, it's caring for mothers who feel desperate um, and feel like they can't care for their children. And it's caring for those children whose mothers can't care for them. Um, and so I'm been trying to find different avenues to get that, to get that word out and to be a person who could help people who want to become foster parents or want to become adoptive parents. And um, my husband and I, uh, we were foster parents for a short period of time and we fostered a little girl and were able to adopt her and she's just been this beautiful wonderful blessing in our life and I want I want to help other people who want to do that so I'm, I'm trying to get something up off the ground with that and then second is kind of like with this podcast I want to encourage people to be okay with who they are I mean to be okay with you know, if you're Pentecostal with wearing the skirt, with getting out there, with feeling comfortable with who you are and what your standards are and knowing that you don't have to be stuck in a house hiding, um, that there's opportunities for, for you as well. So that's, those are kind of the two things that I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to develop right now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really beautiful. Uh, I just want to understand, what do you mean? Um, the children that the, that the government, wants to or the state wants to remove like it's just yeah what does that mean so we have the department of family protective services here in texas and there's some version of that in every state in america and they have authority and through the state to remove children from homes if they have evidence that that child is being abused or neglected and where i live the biggest issue is um, drug use um we have just a huge out, outbreak, I don't know how, what else to call it, epidemic of um, people on methamphetamine, methamphetamines and similar drugs. Um, and it's just, they just completely neglect their children, you know, when they're, when they're oh, taking them. So, yeah. So most of our cases here aren't even really physical abuse to a child. It's just mom is strung out on meth and children are just not being taken care of. So the state has the authority when they have solid evidence of that to come into a home and remove those children from that home um, and then place them hopefully with relatives who can take care of them. Or if they can't find relatives then friends, if they can't find friends and they're just put in foster homes, um, you know, people, they is a foster home, like an adoptive, uh, an adoptive house. It can be. Um, so the way it works in Texas is um, when you remove a child, there's a one year process for the parent 
for the department to work with that parent and try to get that parent back up on their feet, um, off drugs, into rehab, all those different things. And, and the main goal is usually to reunify that child with their parent at the end of the year. Um, mm-hmm. So they would stay in a foster home temporarily. So that may not ever become an adoptive home. It may just be a, a, a home to go stay in until mom or dad or whoever can get their life on track. And then the goal is usually to put that child back with their parents after mom and dad get clean, but more often than not, the case is unsuccessful. And so more often than not at the end of the year, um, the state has to try to get the parents' rights terminated or the parents just voluntarily relinquish their rights. And then the state starts looking for an adoptive home. And if those foster parents also have a license to adopt, then a lot of times the foster parents will go ahead they're fostering but it's usually at least a one-year process so one second so it's a one-year process to try to get the parents to work with the kid and then another year process from an adopt from an, a, no. a foster home to adoptive home no it's just one year usually one year all together if if those if, mm. the, if the foster home is already licensed to adopt and the one year goes by and the parents rights are terminated then they can usually move immediately into adoption mm. So what does it mean to foster a kid? It's you take a kid into your home. Um, you, you're you licensed with the state um, to be a foster parent. So there's a bunch of rules you have to follow um, because you're you're bringing these kids into your home and you love them and you you parent them, but you're you're not their parent. You know, you always know in the back of your head that that child could leave your home. Um, they could go somewhere else. They could go back to their parents. They could go to a relative who steps forward and wants to take care of them. But you're your mom and dad for as long as you need to be to that child. Um, and the state helps you. The state will provide medical insurance for the child and child care and all of that for the, for the time that you have them. But you give them a loving home. You take them to the doctor. I mean, you treat them just like, you know, you would treat your own children. Um, but just knowing that you're not their, their actual parent. So they may leave at some point. And there's, there's a lot of rules, you know, you can't take them out of the state without permission from the court. Um, the state, uh, the department of family and protective services keeps tabs on whether they're going to the doctor or they're having their immunizations, you know, they're eating well, going to school. Um, so it's, it's loving that child from the point you get them until the point they may be taken away and providing all of their needs in a, in a safe, healthy, happy home for them as long as you're needed to do that. Wow. So it sounds like it could be, it sounds like it could be a little bit heart wrenching, you know, to take oh, someone yeah. into your house for like a year, you grow emotionally attached yes. to them and then they it, could just leave, you know, after a year. Yes, it is. It's, it's very heart wrenching. I mean, and, Fortunately, the, the one child we fostered, um, we never had to lose. You know, we, we got to adopt her. Um, and so I couldn't imagine what other people go through. And so um, emotionally, when if that child is removed from the home and has to go back home, but what we always tell people is, remember, you're, you're, you're in it for the child. You're in it for them. So as heart-wrenching as it may be for you, it would be so much worse for that child not even to have this little bit of time with you. Right. Right. Um, wow. That's amazing. It's so inspiring. So today you have your own girl, yes. which is, you adopted. Yes. We adopted her last year. It's been almost a year now. And our, um, our other children are boys and she's our only girl and she's a lot younger than them. So she has just mm. been this wonderful gift to all of us and she is spoiled rotten <laughs> she, <laughs> she rules the house <laughs> awesome I love it I love it I love it it's amazing it's beautiful what's her name her name is uh, Lily Lily oh that's such a sweet name yes her real na- well we changed her name when we got her she was she was young enough for us to do that so this is the name we gave her but we named her um Elizabeth Ruth and we call her Lily ah Awesome. How come you named her that? So um, my my other children are Eli and Caleb. So we've just always picked names from the Bible that, you know, that means something. And so Elizabeth and Ruth, 
are both from the Bible, but Elizabeth is also my husband's mother's middle name. And then Ruth is my mother's middle name. Mm. I see. Wow. So, um, yes, they really have meaning, these names. Yes. I wanted her to have, have you know, an, a name out of the Bible, but I also wanted her to have names that meant something and that were for our family to just complete her, you know, inclusion into our life and our family. Right. Actually, we're just coming into the story of uh, Shavuot, which is the holiday where we got the Bible um, in the in our religion and Judaism. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the story, the story of Ruth. Yes. I love that story. (laughs) Yeah. Can you tell us like a short version of it? (laughs) Of the story of Ruth? Yes. Yeah. So Ruth was, um, was it Naomi, right? Uh, Daughter-in-law. Yeah. Yeah, So Naomi has to leave the promised land during a famine because her husband wants her to. And she goes into a foreign land and has two sons and both her sons marry um, foreign ladies, Ruth. And I think the other one was Orpa. Um, I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. And her husband dies and both of her sons die without ever having children. So she's completely destitute. She has Mm. no spouse, no children and no descendants whatsoever. And she decides she's going back home and she sends both of her daughters-in-law back to their family so they can start over. And Ruth just in this beautiful act of love says, no, I'm going with you. No matter what you tell me, I'm going to go with you. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And Mm. they go back to the land of Israel and God blesses Ruth by sending a near kinsman of Naomi's, um Boaz to to marry Ruth and they have a son and she gives that son to her mother-in-law Naomi um to raise as her own so she'll have a lineage she'll have descendants and that child ends up being in the lineage of King David (laughs) so the the Mm. greatest king so it's just this beautiful story of of selfless love wow that's beautiful so, which is exactly the story of you and, and your little Lily. You know what? I didn't even think about that. Until you, just, you know, I named her that because that was my, <laughs> my mom's middle name. But yeah, you know, I, I hope. <laughs> so. There you go. There you go. Well, they say that the, that the mission of each person lies in the first place where their name is denoted in the Bible. Oh, wow. I've never heard that. Yeah, so so that's that's just a small gem for you. And, um, you know, I actually, one of my favorite songs growing up was by this uh, singer. Her name is Susan Cates. I actually can't find her anymore. I've Googled her all over the internet. I can't find her. But she had this one song, which is the song that Ruth sings to Naomi. Um, the second, you know, you said Naomi sends them off, but Ruth is like, no, your people are my, are my people. So um, can I sing it for you? Yes. Okay, so it goes like, Amech, Ahami, Velokai, Velokai, Amech, Ahami, Velokai, Velokai. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. That's basically the meaning of, uh, you know, the word of um, your, your people are my people and wherever you go, I will go. And, um, yeah, that's one of the most beautiful scriptures. I think, you know, that, that selfless, your people, my, you know, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And, and I actually at a, at a wedding last year and um, they wrote their own vows and that's what, that's what the bride told the groom. And I thought, oh, wow, that's, that's beautiful. So, wow. which, which is really, I think that is, that's really the essence of, of, um, unconditional unconditional love is that you know you're kind of saying like with your differences and like with my differences like we're still we're still one and we're still going with each other and accepting each other yes because Ruth and Naomi had 
huge differences. They weren't the same people. They weren't the same culture. <laughs> I mean, they weren't the same nationality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and same, and same are we, you know, I'm Jewish, you're Christian, you know, we also have the Muslims and like, you know, I guess there has to be a way for all of us to kind of like get along together. Yes, I agree. And that's kind of the beauty of the modesty movement too, is it transcends these cultures and these religions um, and, and can be something that can unite because we stick out from the rest of the world. You know, we're not you and me and, and others of, of different religions that, that um, want to look this way. Um, it, you, you stick out, you stick out when you're at the park, when you're in a race, um, you stand out in the, in the way you dress and that can be uniting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. For sure. So, um, Crystal, we're just about to, you know, finish up. I just wanted to ask you a few last questions. Okay. So, um, what's your definition of modesty? I mean, I keep trying to decline it. Um, my definition of modesty, that's, that's a hard one. To me, it's a way that in my actions, in my outer appearance, um, in my speech and in my attitude that I can show that uh, it's not all about me, Um, that I I shouldn't put myself first. I should put God um, and others before me. Um, So my clothes um, shouldn't be, hey, look at me. Um, And my speech and my attitude should be um, humble um, and uh, a way to worship God and a way to love his people and his creation. It's beautiful. Okay. And if there's one thing that you feel unites the Christians, the Muslims and the Jews, what would it be? Um. I, I think those the very religious of religious of these three different religions. Um, I think they all believe that 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 they're not first. That there's a greater purpose out there. Um, they're showing a, a willingness and a desire to put that purpose um, before them. To see that there's a, a God that they worship who is bigger than they are and who is more important than their, their personal <laughs> goals in life. Um, and I think all of us have that desire to live for that, something that's bigger. And I think that can be uniting because we all believe it's not, our lives are not about us personally. There is a creator and he's in control and we should live in a way that's pleasing to him. Yeah, that's amazing. And Crystal, how can my listeners find you on on podcasts? Okay, so I'm on um, you know the Apple Podcasts or iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, any of those, and it's just called In a Skirt Podcast. Um, or I have a website, inaskirt.com. Um, and I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and it's just all at in a skirt. Awesome. That's pretty easy as well. <laughs> yeah. Easy. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I really you, had Anna. such a great time. Yeah, I did too. And I love, I've been all over your website and Instagram stalked you on all of that. And I'm going to have to let people know about your awesome active wear. It's really cute. It's not just, you know, looks functional, but it also looks really stylish. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'd love, I'd love that. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, looking forward to speaking again. Yeah, me too. Okay, bye-bye. Bye.